Hi, Teach Lab listeners. We're doing a two-part series on personalized learning and tutoring in response to the pandemic and the unfinished learning that students are experiencing. Uh, last episode, we talked to Matthew Mugo Fields from Houghton Mifflin. And this week, we're talking with Matt Kraft from Brown University around his blueprint for a national tutoring initiative. Let's go ahead and listen. From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. Today's guest is Matthew Kraft. He's an associate professor of education and economics at Brown University, where his research and teaching interests include the economics of education and education policy analysis. His primary work focuses on efforts to improve educator and organizational effectiveness in K-12 urban public schools. Matt's research has been featured in The Economist, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, many other places. Matt, we're so happy to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you, Justin. Great to be here with you. So, Matt, we're particularly excited to have you today um, because you've just released this very timely working paper, a blueprint for scaling tutoring across public schools. Um, and, you know, I think the heart behind this is that it's been a very challenging year for educators, a very challenging year for students. And you know, despite heroic, valiant efforts by educators, students in the 2020, you know, 2020, 2021 school year are just not gonna learn what students would have learned in the 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019 school year. Um, and you know, there's probably some of those things that we can go, eh, you know, that stuff's pretty good, but like you'll be all right without it. But there's other parts of that that are really important for students, um, and we want to help them, you know, finish some of that unfinished learning. Um, what, what's the rationale for thinking of tutoring as one of the first places to go to address those kinds of challenges? As a former teacher, I couldn't agree more with the heartfelt respect and appreciation for everyone out there in classrooms and on computers, trying to support kids through this unbelievably challenging time. There is no doubt that it's just not as good to teach remotely or in a hybrid context. It is for teachers to be with kids in school every day for a full academic year. And it's, given, and it's certainly and it's certainly not the case to do that like in an emergency with no training, <laughs> with no practice, with no institutional structures. I mean, I think we might be able to imagine that there's some versions of online school that might work just fine for some kids. It's probably not impossible to conceive of, but definitely if you were to think if you were to come up with ideas to like substantially hobble educational systems, making everyone instantly become an online teacher is probably one of the most effective ways to do that. Well said. And certainly things are going better, improving compared to the emergency remote transition we had in the spring. Um, I know from you know even my own son's first grade experience at being fully remote that things have really started to click. But you know the social emotional learning, just being with peers and the peer learning that that's just that's absent and you can't make up for that in many ways. There's, there's a beautiful op-ed, I think it was in the Boston Globe about a teacher who was sort of lamenting like, my kids aren't fighting over crayons. Like there's, there's <laughs> nothing that they have to share. Think about all the negotiation, all the language, all the social emotional learning that happens when you fight over a crayon. Um, you know, it's, it's one of, it's, you know, to me it was one of the sort of millions of things I think we've realized in the past year that we take for granted about schools. Um, you know, no, if no, no education policymaker would ever say like it's really important to make sure kids are fighting over crayons but it turns out it is luckily in my household <laughs> they I've still got have a four-year-old daughter who uh, fills that role quite expertly Phew. Uh, All right. <laughs> but nonetheless i think that the conversation today is kind of like where does tutoring fit in this world why, why should we think about tutoring what role might it have to play to support students, but also actually support teachers if we're, if we're being serious about kind of a collective effort to um, serve kids. So the idea here, I think, is relatively intuitive. It 
just makes sense based on how kids learn from parents and their peers over time throughout history that learning in small groups or even one-on-one -on -one settings is exactly the type of kind of serve and return valley that individualized learning thrives in. And so the, I think the intuition is there. Yeah, medieval and lords recognized that like, <laughs> you know, young children needed their own governess. Like, the, you know, it's not rocket science to, um, to figure out that tutoring is a, is a model of learning that works in lots of circumstances. No doubt. And, and lo and behold, when you dig into the research, it's an incredibly compelling body of rigorous evidence to suggest that tutoring programs in the wild, in school systems, after school, when implemented well with high dosage, i.e. getting tutored a couple times a week for at least half an hour or so a session, really make a difference for students learning. And so... Who, who's done that kind of, I mean, is this like lots of countries, lots of states? Is it by for-profit providers, by schools? Like who, who did some of these studies that let us have this kind of confidence? So there's been a number of meta-analyses, which are basically researchers taking a whole bunch of other studies and summarizing those studies in one kind of aggregate um, piece. And there's actually been a huge range of researchers both in kind of the education psychology world, the ed researcher world, the economics world that have looked at this question. And primarily um, the evidence that we think might be most compelling comes from randomized control trials where we randomly assign a student to receive tutoring or kind of business as usual in an after school experience. Um, and Across more than 100 of these types of studies, the average impact on student achievement is equivalent to taking a kid who's at the 35th percentile of achievement and moving them up to the 50th. Now, this is a big change in the world of kind of student achievement, educational practice. And so there's not many things that we know how to do that help students that much, especially not many of that sort of concrete well, like you just said, do this for half an hour, two or three times a week. Um, you know, that's something that we can, like, like organizationally, we can get our head around what that requires. And you're telling us that like across a hundred plus studies where half the kids get this thing, half the kids don't, the kids, as far as we can tell, are sort of identical in each group. Um, you know, that we see on average pretty substantial, you know, for, for you know, this, this is one of the things that we could do that we could be pretty confident works pretty well for students. That's right. And so then the question becomes kind of, well, it worked on average really well across these studies. Of course, there's variation. Some of these kind of didn't pan out. Some of them were, you know, far exceeded our expectations. Um, but compared to a lot of other things we've tried out there in the wild, this is just a really efficacious thing. And so the question is, well, these were these kind of smaller boutique programs with folks who are really excited to implement them. And what does that mean for what we can pull off at scale? Because the scale of the challenge is talking about the 50 million plus students who are experiencing major disruptions to their learning in our public education system. So now, a lot of these randomized control trials, they might have been like, oh, well, let's take 100 kids in an after school program um, and put 50 of them here and 50 of them there. And the kids might be in the after school program because their parents knew to sign up for it. Um, and, you know, the program agrees to do this randomized controlled trial because it's run by a bunch of like savvy young program directors. <laughs> so, so while to some extent it looks like a sort, you know, like, a, you know, it is in certain respects a really rigorous way to do research, but it's just the problem is the places where you can do these kinds of studies might not be like, um, you know, more typical settings with where where the vast majority of our students end up. So that's the kind of, uh, that's is that part of what you're describing is kind of the trick of scaling? Like, we know these things work in some special places where you can do cool studies, and now we got to figure out if they can work, you know, in many more places that might, you know, be like somewhat less extraordinary. I think that's exactly right. It, and to be honest, it's not just about that. Tutoring is not free, nor is yep. it relatively inexpensive. Now, if we ask a different question, is it 
cost effective? The answer is yes. It's actually quite cost effective in terms of what you get versus what it costs. But this is a moment when districts budgets are just extremely strapped. And, and it, the, despite what is likely to be uh, federal aid coming down the pike, those increased operating costs to just deliver regular schooling with, you know, safely with the current context of the pandemic have, have really made for a challenging circumstance to ask schools to take on something that is costly. So another question in this kind of blueprint that I've proposed with my colleague, Grace Falcon, is to ask, well, how much would it cost to do this if we're serious about doing it? And where might the money come from? And then the third, I think, you know, pillar of this idea is where would we get all these tutors? I yep. mean, if we're talking at scale, tutoring is about, you know, one to one, two to one, three to one. Like, you, it's just a lot of bodies. And so yeah, how yeah. can we think create creatively around who can serve as a tutor and serve effectively? Yeah. If you're looking to tutor 50 million kids, then you're, you're at least looking into millions of additional people to, to help do that. All right. So, so why don't we take those questions in turn? The first one is how much is this going to cost? Like how, how many kids are we in a tutor and about what do we think that would be? So let's start with the idea that if we had an ambitious goal to target tutoring for all, say, K to eight Title I schools. And That's Title I huge... schools are those schools where a certain percentage of students are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. So it's sort of a proxy of the, of the number of students who live in poverty impacted homes. That's right. And so, this would be, you know, we're talking tens of millions of students. Our estimate ballpark is that's going to cost around 10 billion. You know, you can, you can give a range if you'd like, but just to put that in context, about $10 billion. Now that's about ballpark, about what we spend in other kind of federal uh, support programs, um, related to education and, you know, for example, the entire current funding for Title I is about $15 billion annually. So this is a huge amount of money, mm -hmm. but it's also less than 1% of the total amount we spend on public education in the United States. So it's relative to what the existing federal programs, this would be a monumental kind of new investment. But relative to what we actually spend, given that most education um, funding comes from local and state sources, this is actually uh, a very small fraction. Right. And, and let me just make one point clear. We're, we're in, in a process of envisioning. So there's we've kind of suspended reality here a little bit to just ask some big questions, conduct the thought experiment. I really envision this as being a slow incremental process of growth where entrepreneurial and interested schools and districts try things out, are in the vanguard of seeing what works for them. If it does work for them, they share their best practices, their neighboring schools and districts observe things working and it, it grows from the ground up. We can't forget that things like kindergarten, which we take for granted in our now, you know, K to 12 system, didn't exist several decades ago. And it took about 30 years for kindergarten to slowly make its way into the standard public school system that we know it to be today. And so I think we need to have the long view here. And, and that sets up this kind of funny tension between the conversation around we need to immediately step in and act to support kids who are struggling today versus how can we over the long run complement the group instruction that is common in public schools and classrooms with individualized instruction as a whole child approach. Because in a sense, you're saying, yes, there's extraordinary educational needs that are urgent like our system has never faced before. But frankly, even if there wasn't a pandemic, uh, 
a, a national blueprint for tutoring might still be a good idea. Just our regular pre-COVID system, um, young people could benefit from having more individual time one-on-one um, -on -one with caring adults who want to help them learn. Um, it just happens to be that at the moment, you know, we feel these needs extremely urgently. That's exactly right. In fact, I, I wrote a blog now over five years ago, much to the spirit of, hey, what if we just had a tutor for every struggling student in this country? And that was certainly kind of pre-pandemic thinking. I think what's unique now is that there's just been a, a wellspring of interest in tutoring from a lot of different corners and sectors of uh, kind of education and policy. And so the timing is right to talk about what it would mean to scale tutoring. And it might create this unique window where we also have the flexibility and kind of bravado to rethink schedules in a way that we might not otherwise have given that the pandemic has forced us to do so already. Yeah, we, I mean, we know for a fact that if we have to, we can make very substantial changes to all kinds of organizational structures in schools if we think it's what we need to do to keep students safe, to keep teachers safe, to make learning work. Um, all right, so it'll cost us about $10 billion, um, which is a lot relative to what we spend now um, from the federal government, but not so much uh, relative to what schools spend in general. Um, how would the whole thing work? Um, what, what, would a what would a national tutoring plan, like where would we find these people and what would they do? So there's a, I think of a, a debate going on right now um, about how to scale tutoring. And I think there are different visions of what this would look like. And, and when we say national, I think that evokes different visions. Like does national mean that the federal government stands up a federally run, entirely operated thing that shows up in the community and starts to tutor kids? Or are we saying national in the sense that we want a whole bunch of tutors across this country? So to, to kind of add some, some specifics to that idea, I think what we're talking about is a federally funded program to scale tutoring nationally by building it from the ground up with local tutoring efforts. And so what does it actually look like? I think it could look like a lot of different things, to be honest. And, and there is and no all one. all kinds of different contexts. There's tiny little rural schools. There's huge right. urban schools. There's places with colleges nearby. There are places that are a million miles from colleges. So it's going to look different in lots of different kinds of places, no matter what. It has to if we're talking about scale. And that's part of the rub here is that it, it, the evidence suggests that tutors who are full-time college grads who've had extensive training are likely to be more effective than, for example, uh, current college students that are serving in a part-time role as a federal work study or um, certainly even high school students that I propose we might consider. Um, and to be clear, in an ideal world, we would have fully certified teachers who are trained as you know expert pedagogues to do this work. Um, that is unrealistic. We have a teacher workforce of four million right now, and and are struggling to just staff those positions, let alone kind of <laughs> double that workforce. But I, I don't mean to say that this tutoring doesn't require important. Um, instructional skills. It's just, I think those are different from managing a full class of kids, differentiating instruction, group instruction. Uh, I think tutoring, when well-supported and well-trained, can be done by a range of individuals who some will be good, some will be better, some will be great, depending on their skill and content knowledge and understanding of the local community. But what I think this looks like, to answer your question, is basically Federal dollars, ideally, or if need be, philanthropic or state dollars, helping districts to staff within the district system positions that are these leadership positions that run a tutoring program and that are staffed by either coordinating and creating partnerships with local two and four year colleges and universities through federal work study or 
students who are in teacher preparation programs, expanding AmeriCorps, the national service organization that already does this at kind of small scales and through organizations like um, City Year or um, Minnesota Reading Corps, you know, they've got different models. And, and the one that I think we envision is a little bit more narrowly focused on tutoring rather than some other wraparound services or after school. But I think the, the key difference here is that we're talking about this as being a, an element of the school day, something that kids experience in a class, ideally, so that it's a regular expectation, it's got an academic culture, it is something that all students attend rather than trickling out after the school bell rings at the end of the day and maybe staying or not. And so these are the pieces that we envision coming together to scale tutoring based on some of the features of tutoring that have shown to be most elements of those most effective programs. So, you know, in like a K-5 school, probably within a typical day, there's sort of all kinds of time that kids are doing independent time or other kinds of things. And everyone's just kind of rotating out with a teacher, you know, maybe in six, seven, eight, when people sort of have classes, their study halls become tutoring sessions, or maybe you have to make school one period longer um, in order to sort of fit this time in. But it's, but you're, what you're not saying is at 2.15, sort of open up all the classrooms and like everybody goes out to their tutoring session. Um, that this becomes more part of, you know, art, music, English, social studies, um, my time with a tutor. And that tutor, if I'm a really young person, might be a high school student. If I'm a middle schooler, it might be, a, um, you know, a two or four year college student. I mean, I assume that for, you know, for the students who have highest needs, you know, people with particular kind of learning disabilities, reading disabilities or something like that. We're not pairing them with a high school student. We're pairing them with some, you know, paraprofessional specialist who knows something about uh, those issues. Is that kind of what the what the model might look like? That's just right. You know, we're trying to do intuitive pairing. So certainly contact knowledge is going to be a, a kind of a factor that limits who can tutor students in upper grades. Um, and so we would imagine it would be the college graduates that are more likely to have stronger content knowledge. Although of course not guaranteed depending on what they studied and interested yep. in. Um, but as a thought experiment, yeah, older kids who are in high school, let's find the college grads, college students, middle schoolers, elementary kids, uh, potentially leveraging high schoolers again, Less evidence there, the evidence I talked about at the beginning of the show, largely comes from the kind of full-time service tutoring programs or, or part-time volunteer, adult volunteer or college uh, tutoring programs. So the idea of leveraging high schoolers and, and other peers as tutors is not novel. I bet you listeners to this podcast will be able to raise their hand and say, like, oh, my School has a kind of small little boutique program that we developed around reading buddies. So yep. I think it's intuitive, but the the research based on that is uh, limited, and and so it's it's unclear if we if we think it would work at scale. Uh, that element of it, but somewhere you know, if you want to serve all, you know, it's probably thirty million kids who are K through eight, or you know, or some or fifty million or something like that. Like you've got to come up with a lot of people. Um, and uh, certainly there are a lot of high schoolers and, and, and college age students, you know, who both could help, but probably would really want to help. You know, I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, I, I particularly right now, I think a lot of people feel like um, there's a kind of a, a call to service in, in certain kinds of ways. Um, what does I, so when I hear tutoring, one of the things that immediately comes to my mind is sort of like, remediating students who are not on track to meeting state standards on accountability tests. Um, but I could also imagine, you know, a, a, to me, perhaps the most compelling idea around tutoring is that, you know, wouldn't it be great just to have more young people have adults who know them and listen to them and care about them and talk to them about stuff that they're interested in. Um, right. How how much do you imagine a tutoring program being oriented around, um, you know, uh, 
plugging the specific kind of deficits and issues that adults see in young people and learners? And how much do you imagine these programs as being, you know, more about a time for, you know, individual or small groups of kids to be able to, to learn with adults about, you know, some things that the school may want them to learn and some things that the kids may want to learn. So at the end of the day, I think we need to be honest with ourselves about how we, what the goals are for the program. And when we say tutoring, that's this kind of empty vessel. We're like, how do we fill that vessel? What's yep. the time that's happening? It's clear to me that in education reform, regardless of what it is, unless the teachers on the ground and the students and the parents who are supporting them are invested in that, what a thing is, it, it's, it's just not going to work. And so I, I think that has to be a decision that families and communities and schools make. Certainly, I'll kind of pitch my vision of how they might think about that decision. So I think there is strong reason to target core literacy and numeracy skills as an element of tutoring. And I think in doing so, you can, with the right amount of training and support in sustained relationships, i.e., we don't have a rotating cast of tutors showing up and you forget who your student is and you don't know much about them. It, you, you want a sustained relationship. Me and Matt are hanging out for a semester and like Matt's my guy who's going to help me this year figure some stuff out. That's right. And I know Justin is kind of into like the Dungeons and Dragons reading, like he'll, he'll do the stuff he wants to, but not so much the other stuff. And yep. so like I, I'm figuring that out and I can, I can find those kind of turn on the light bulb, connect to your interests, uh, avenues. But I think that having something to build off from is a starting point. Some type of instructional materials that are about supporting kids to do grade level work by figuring out if they need extra support to be able to achieve that. It's not going back and reteaching old stuff just because they got a certain score on a test. It's asking, what are you trying to do in your current class? Mm -hmm. And what challenges are you experiencing that might prevent you from having success in that? And so, you know, there, there's a debate about, like, we need to accelerate, not remediate. And inside classrooms, like, I'm not sure that those words have as much meaning as they do in the kind of educational policy arena of debate. Um, but... I think the idea here is that if, if we have something that a tutor can build off of, so when the student doesn't come with questions, which is probably likely to be quite frequent, right? Yeah. Um, they're not just like, well, like, let's talk about the weather. Or, like, th there's, there's a push, there's a drive. But ideally, we want more. We want them to start out by getting to know the student, by, by hopefully becoming another caring adult in their life. And this is anecdotal, but I think there's reason to think that tutors do a better job when they feel like they're making a difference. And it's easier to see that you're making a difference when a kid is making small incremental improvements and little victories in academic content. You, you can like see that happening. And so I think there's some kind of reinforcing, potential reinforcing processes there when you build on core academics. Now, you might say, well, what, what about those kids who are doing great in those subjects? Uh, it, this is where the kind of, is tutoring for remediating COVID learning loss or is tutoring just about helping to improve how we deliver instruction in schools generally? I would argue that with scarce resources and the current emergency pandemic, we should target our efforts towards schools where kids have experienced concentrated harm from the pandemic. And I can see a world where we build from there. And so we, we, we have an equity lens for targeting those communities that need the most support. 
building the program that ideally taps local uh, supply of tutors who know the context of that community um, and know kids' daily experience and lives, but that we should think bigger. I, I, I would be really disappointed if what happens is a rapid but temporary, ancillary, and remedial-focused tutoring effort that kind of goes by the wayside in a year or two because it's viewed as about a response to a pandemic rather than a, a shift in how we think about instruction. One of the things that strikes me about an increased emphasis on you know literacy and numeracy, reading and math, um, is that's kind of what, you know, in, in the schools that we're talking about, that can kind of be all day anyway. I mean, there are a lot of schools that already feel a bunch of pressure mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. more reading and math. And there's, you know, there's an alternate argument out there, which is like, you know, don't these kids need the arts? Don't these kids need yeah. music? Don't these kids need more time outside? Don't they need to learn to code? I mean, one of the most interesting thing to me about our initial response to the pandemic, um, if you look across the policy guidance in late March from the 50 states, um, there are all kinds of states that offered sort of sample schedules. And there's two features that struck me about the sample schedules. Um, one is they were shorter. People said, look, you're not going to get six or seven hours of work out of kids remotely. Let, let's just try to do two or three hours of things. But within those two or three hours, um, the, many sample schedules said what our kids do during the pandemic is daily arts and daily PE. They need daily exercise and daily creative expression. Um, and it sort of struck me like, yeah, you know, as it turns out, American schools do not offer children daily <laughs> opportunities for creative expression and exercise during non-COVID times. This might be a kind of thing that we would want to remember. We might, you know, put a pin in this and come back to it, friends, um, later on. Why, you know, um, what what would you what would you say? I mean, but and I also think this is just you know sort of a constant refrain in American policy reform. Um, you know, do we focus on a few core academic things or do we focus on a kind of whole child approach? But you know, but to folks who have been knocking on the doors of schools for a long time, saying more arts, more exercise, more STEM, more coding, sort of a, you know a more holistic curriculum, particularly after the No Child Left Behind years. That, that, that in America's, you know, most poverty impacted schools um, constrain the curriculum. Like if we're going to add sort of 30 more minutes to the school day, you know, even if it's through tutoring, um, why should that still be math and literacy? I'm glad you're pushing on this point because it it's really cuts to the heart of what's the purpose of schools and schooling and, and what do we want to use scarce time to, to do with students. So this, the status quo right now is that affluent families can access tutoring in the private market and do so at a rapidly expanding rate. The, the private market in the US alone for tutoring is over $47 billion annually. There was an incredibly powerful article in the Boston Globe a couple of days ago, um, which we'll put in the show notes about kids having reading difficulties during the pandemic. And, you know, the crux of the story was there were sort of three or four stories of poverty impacted kids, um, language, learn, you know, English language learners suffering tremendously. And then there are a couple of rich kids who are like actually with reading disabilities who are doing better during the pandemic because their parents were like, oh, well, if you're not in school, just hire private tutors who have specialized training about these things. You know, the parents are saying, oh, the pandemic, you know, like lots about the pandemic isn't great, but my kids are really thriving because I finally managed to get them the personalized supports that they need. So um, we'll put a link to that, but I just think it was an incredibly powerful example of just what you said, um, which is, that, you know, that, that if you can afford it, there's plenty of tutoring out there to be had. That just really highlights in stark terms the, the inequities of the status quo. And so if we are to not think about changing how schooling works, it, it is in effect a default acceptance of that current world. And so what I'm saying is given the empirical evidence, given the just willingness of parents to pay a whole bunch of money for tutoring, I think it's likely that 
it can be effective. There's no guarantees. It has to be done well and it won't work great at first and you're going to have to improve. There's a whole bunch of kind of landmines as there always are. But with a, a sustained commitment to continuous improvement and like problem solving, there's, I think, potential here as much as there is for any other things that we do in school. And so let's have that be part of the school day so that it's equitably accessible for all kids, particularly those kids who most need it. And then the question is, well, where do we get that time? And so our vision is to add time to the school day because I 100% support the idea that uh, athletics, physical education, the quote specials of you know developing arts and, and language and music um, are essential to not only kids kind of whole child education, but about making them be excited about school and engaged in school and developing um, kind of those socialization skills. So I, I wouldn't argue that we need to like chop off one of those periods and fill it in with kind of drill and kill core math and reading. But I also think that it's almost a privilege to say, well, like all these other things are super important. Well, that's also likely the case if you have those basic skills to access all of those things. And if you're lacking those basic skills to read and, and, and do basic you know, arithmetic, then you are gonna have a real tough time accessing opportunity immediately after high school, if not even graduating. And so I think it's about an, an equity issue of opening opportunity. And so my hope is that we can do that. We can do that in a way that also builds kind of mentorship um, into that process. And if a school raised their hand and said, hey, we wanna go all in on tutoring for coding, or we wanna go all in on like a social emotional learning curriculum, I would say, Go for it. Like, let's see what we can do with that. Let's learn from that practice. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to me, the kind of compelling whole child uh, argument behind tutoring is kind of actually regardless of what you do with them. The really important thing is to just get one more caring adult in young people's lives. Um, and, uh, you know, the it, it, and I also and I also think that the the places where. Um, where an, where an overemphasis on an overly narrow curriculum can feel dehumanizing to kids, you know, could can conceivably be humanized um, by a, you know a tutor who can you know know what their individual kid is interested in and you know make connect, right. you know make individual connections between. All right, well, we're doing some math here, but that's because you know you really like these Pokemon characters. We're gonna play this, you know, whatever, 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 whatever that might be. You know, um, um, sort of sort of a range of those kinds of choices. Were you did you ever have a tutor when you were growing up? Let's see. So I was a tutor in college. Mm -hmm. So I had the, the kind of the flip side of that. Um, and when I was young, I, I had some trouble with my speech. And so I had a speech therapist that worked with me one-on-one, -on -one, which, you know, isn't a traditional tutor, but it's someone that like gives you that one-on-one -on -one attention and then that linguistic support and feedback that I think is exactly the spirit of what we're talking about here. Yeah. Someone that, someone that gets to know you a little bit, someone who identifies some of the things that you're struggling with, helps you build capacity, helps you feel more confident and all of the other things. That's that right. you, you know, as you know, I was, and I think a lot of students likely are, there's a little bit of kind of defensiveness or, you know, you can be kind of ashamed of not knowing something that you think you should technically know or be able to do. And so there has to be that relationship there with someone who's going to, you know, open up with about the struggles you might have experienced and be willing to engage rather than kind of the behavioral reaction, which is not uncommon, which is I, rather than do this thing that I can't, I'm just going to kind of act like I don't want to or act out so I don't have to. Well, and, you know, there's a huge difference between a tutoring program that serves a wide range of students and a tutoring program that's targeted only at the most struggling kids that becomes a kind of stigmatizing experience, you know, like being pulled out for extra reading help feels an awful lot di different than when like 
all of your seventh grade buddy reading buddies come into the second grade classroom, you know, and everyone goes and hugs their, their friend and sits down with them and does reading together. I mean, you know, to, I mean, to some extent they exist to serve the same function to build literacy capacity, but they can feel very, very different to young people. Um, I, I think the culture piece here is really important. And, and so that is why in our kind of blueprint, we, argue for a school-wide model. That doesn't mean it needs to be every school in the country immediately. That's probably never realistic. But I think it's it's that idea that if a school is committed to it, then that means that we're going to be building a schedule around that because it's for everyone rather than like, how do we just, you know, deal with these five kids? Like, kind of they can be taken out of this or glommed onto that and I'm not going to adjust the sports schedule for just five kids and so I, I think there's just you need this kind of collective commitment and that's what a I think a school-wide program can give you now that costs dollars and so in, in kind of resource constrained times it there are real trade-offs and so I can solely see that argument for right now right here focusing on uh specific kids that are particularly struggling, but then we have to be really conscious about the potential for that to be kind of a stigmatizing context. And how do we talk about that? How do we address it? How do we make it uh, something where they're not ashamed, but they, they feel kind of uh, supported? I wonder, you know, there's another sort of labor issue here um, that I imagine that you've thought of, which is that, you know, let's say districts are facing you know, five to 10% budget cuts in the coming year in which they're just going to have to let go full-time staff. Seems very difficult to hire paraprofessionals, sort of low-wage recent college grads at the same time that you're letting go, you know, full-time teachers, unionized teachers, um, those kinds of things. You know, by contrast, I think it becomes, you know, if there's some huge, you know, if, if part of the next 1.9 trillion budget kind of manages to su sort of successfully refill the coffers of states and school districts so that they're not, you know, I mean, of course, there's going to be some district right. somewhere who's facing budget cuts. But if generally speaking, you know, people feel like they can look ahead to 2021 funding and their, you know, crazy ventilation costs got covered and they can, you know, hire the same teacher. You know, does, does it, do you think it matters whether or not you're hiring these, these staff into a context of, um, uh, of teacher layoffs versus like, you know, reasonably robust or continuing funding for schools? It's such a good question. Frankly, if you're a superintendent, and you're faced with these types of budget cuts and you're trying to make difficult decisions, you know, part of the reality is that upwards of 80% of district budgets is allocated towards personnel, both by actual salaries and benefits costs. And so when faced with substantial budget cuts, districts often have little choice but to reduce payroll. And um, when the pandemic first hit, there were large reductions in school staff, but that largely focused on um, non-core instructional staff, the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the you know um, teachers' aides. Um, but without substantial federal investment, teacher layoffs are likely coming. Uh, and so what does that mean as it relates to saying you should spend more money to hire some other folks, um, we shouldn't have to make that trade-off in a country as wealthy <laughs> as ours, is the reality. It's just bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> it's so obvious to me, I don't know, but I mean, I've been a teacher my whole life, but it's like, you know, the pandemic generation did nothing wrong. Like, and every dollar we spend on them is so incredibly likely to pay itself back in the decades ahead. Um, like, you know, of course a humane country would invest, um, you know, whatever it needs to do to make sure that this generation of kids um, gets, you know, the same or better education than past generations. But um, yeah, I guess that perspective is not as yeah. obvious. As the, the, the thing I will say is that I think there is still potential 
without hiring a single new person in the role of tutor to minimally rethink how we deploy adults in, in a school system. What if every single adult who works for a district from the superintendent on down to the bus driver was paired with a small set of kids and they were just like the adult point person, the connection with that kid. And maybe that's just about a quick check-in, maybe it's about shared interests, but I just have to imagine that there are more creative ways to engage students with all these folks who now with the tools of remote learning could connect with students who otherwise have never had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, an adult in their school district and would benefit from it. And so I think it's just budget challenges aside, we have to continue to create, uh, think creatively around getting more individualized touch points with kids. You know, and it, it strikes me that one thing about making that argument in this moment is that that's just been one of the most widely adopted pushes in schools anyway. You know, we, we're facing this mass wave of disengagement, you know, understandable disengagement because more kids feel like they need to work because online school is not as engaging as in-person school because when we reduce school just to its academic components and put that online, it turns out like kids actually come to school to have lunch with their friends, to, um, you know, to play sports, to go to the debate club and like they hang out in math class because that's what you got to do to get all those other things. Um, and so a response in which all kinds of districts have strengthened um, I couldn't tell you how many districts. I think we don't really know exactly what's going on across the country right now, but certainly here over and over, um, you know, we've strengthened our home family connections. We've strengthened our advisory programs. We've asked more people to play more of a role in connecting with individual kids. We've asked our teachers to rearrange their schedules to have sort of more one-on-one -on -one touch points. Um, you know, it seems like the thing that you're asking for is just very much along those lines. You know, we, like we've already demonstrated that we can dramatically reorganize school systems when we need to, um, you know, instead of snapping back to what we were before, um, what if we took this moment of plasticity and uncertainty and said, hey, let, you know, when we, when we recongeal this thing, let's recongeal it in such a way um, that a little bit less time in people's day is spent in whole class environments and a little bit more of their time each day is spent with a person who's older than them, who cares about them, who helps them learn some stuff that we all agree is important. I think that would be a huge silver lining to this terribly, you know, trying and you know deadly experience that our, our country and, and the world is going through. We have known for a while that our education system is not serving many students well. There are huge learning gaps and opportunity gaps in our country and they've been persistent. And so certainly we should be in no rush to return to the status quo, um, even though getting students back in the classroom is, is something that all of us are longing for. I'm sure like myself with two young kids, parents <laughs> everywhere listening, teachers with their own kids. Are, are crying for that. But the pandemic has just sh shown a harsh light on the problems of our system and, and exacerbated them and, and put them in stark relief. And so now we can think about creative solutions, but we can also ask, well, what if we actually invested in, and went forward with the things that we've long thought are meaningful and benefit kids, but we kind of found reasons why they weren't feasible. They, you know, that the system can't, you know, it looks like this with this schedule and like the buses run at this time. So how could we do that? Like, I just, I think the benefit not only is that we've have been forced to change, but we've kind of found it within ourselves to real, recognize that actually yeah, change is possible for a highly decentralized 
you know, very kind of non-dynamic system. All right, one last question for you, Matt, and I don't know if you'll have an answer to it, but if someone today wanted to go to a school or district that had the closest thing to what you're talking about already, um, are there model programs out there that people should look up, should visit, should know more about? I think the program will look different in every context, but I started this journey as a doctoral student by visiting Match Charter School in Boston. And Match is one of the kind of original OGs of high dosage tutoring. Michael Goldstein and his colleagues there developed a model that um, employs AmeriCorps service members to work full days delivering tutoring in a tutoring class throughout an extended day. And that's one of the programs that I evaluated as part of my dissertation and found incredibly large effects. And so I think there's a lot to learn from that model. Certainly the context of that model is very different than other, you know, large systems or rural communities and and everything in between. But um, as a proof point of that this can work, I think that's a great place to start. Matthew Kraft is an associate professor of education and economics at Brown University with Grace Falcon. He's the author of a new working paper, A Blueprint for Scaling Tutoring Across Public Schools. Matt, thanks for a great conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Justin. In the months ahead, we're going to be hearing all kinds of ideas and proposals about tutoring, and there's really no one thinking about it as ambitiously, as creatively, as thoughtfully as Matt Kraft is. So I'm glad that we could have that conversation with him. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. Be sure to subscribe to Teach Lab to get future episodes. And if you like our podcast, leave us a review. You can check out my new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, available from booksellers everywhere. You can read reviews of the book, check out related media, and sign up for online events at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failuretodisrupt.com. And join myself and Vanderbilt professor and author Rich Milner in a free self-paced online course for educators, Becoming a More Equitable Educator, Mindsets and Practices. Through inquiry and practice, you'll cultivate a better understanding of yourself and your students. You gain new resources to help all students thrive and develop an action plan to work in your community to advance the lifelong work of equitable teaching. If you've previously taken the course, we'd love to have you back, bring your colleagues, form a learning circle in your school or community, or just come and participate in our online course. You can find the link to the edX course in our show notes where you can enroll now, and the course will run through August 26, 2021. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe. Until next time.